For this, the second Material Matters Conference held by the City and Guilds of London Art School. So today's event is generously supported by the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art and has been organised by my colleague Harriet Lamb. So and of course well, the material that we're going to be discussing today is clay. Uh, my name is Tom Groves and I'm the head of the Art Histories Department at the Art School and I'm going to be chairing this morning's session. So some of you will probably know the Art School well, but for those of you that don't, we were established in 1854 and have evolved to become a dynamic institution, delivering high quality educa education across a range of disciplines to students of different backgrounds. And we run courses in Art and Design Foundation, undergraduate and postgraduate fine art, historic carving, conservation studies and art and material histories courses. And we also run a series of exciting hands-on summer schools, teaching skills in wood carving, letter carving, stone um, carving, etching, um, figure drawing, and many, many more. Details about our, all our courses and summer courses are, of course, on our website. So whilst we're, we are a major and important contributor to the UK's culture industries, every year launching students into sustainable employment and internationally recognized creative and conservationist practices, the art school has managed to remain small, personable and inclusive. Many of our students talk about the art school as a kind of creative community where staff learn alongside students on a beautiful oasis-like campus in the heart of London. One of the distinguishing features of the art school is the extent to which we focus our attentions on the significance of arts materials and the value of the techniques and craft skills that shape them. Arts materials lie at the core of what we are and our respect for their histories and futures guides our critical thinking, our research and of course our making. Today's conference has emerged out of our expansive research platform which we've called Material Matters. And if you log on to the Art School's website, you can see many examples of the kinds of material focused research our staff, students and alumni engage in. And for the last two years, we've concentrated our research on the theme of clay, that lovely earthy, often brownish plastic and incredibly versatile material that has been used throughout ancient and recent history to shape our material, creative, cultural and spiritual worlds. Clays are used in manufacturing, in medicine, construction, and of course, the creation of some of our most important and cherished, cherished objects. In recent years, it feels to me, at least, that there's been a kind of clay renaissance in, in this country, where artists and ceramicists are inventing new ways to explore its raw and fired forms. Medicine, too, is discovering clay's pharmaceutical potential and industry is developing new applications for its use. The general public too seem to have turned towards clay um, for therapeutic benefit and creative outlet. Clay connects us all on all sorts of levels and despite its long and established cultural history is as relevant today as it ever has been. So today's event takes place across the morning and afternoon session. The speakers we have invited and who have very kindly offered their time and expertise represent a broad range of fields and disciplines. We will start this morning with a talk from Dr. Javier Cuadros, who's the senior, who's a senior researcher at the Natural History Museum. And he will introduce us to clay's varying morphologies on Earth and also on Mars and the secrets that these can reveal. Then at 11 a.m. I will introduce the international artist Chapeau Puyan, who will discuss his politically and historically charged ceramic practice. Then we're going to break for 20 minutes before returning to a session in which Professor Roger Kneebone will talk to Potter Darren Ellis about ceramic making and embodied knowledge. And um, during the session, Darren's going to be sitting at a wheel, a potter's wheel, and, and throwing. So things could get perhaps a bit messy in that session, but we'll see. Uh, then at 12.40, Dr. Abby Shapiro from the he Hepworth Wakefield will talk to us about the powerful ceramic work of artist Elaine Wilson. 
Then we will have a break for lunch and return to four more speakers who my colleague Michael Paraskos will introduce and chair for you this afternoon. And that will take us up to about five o'clock um, for close at the end of the day. Um, all of our speakers have kindly agreed to take a few questions from the audience at the end of their presentations. And we invite you to write these in the Q&A function on Zoom, which is should be accessible just at the bottom of your Zoom pages. Um, and then I'll direct those, those questions to the panelists um, who will answer them. Um, and just to remind you, the event is being recorded and you'll all be able to access the recording of each of the panelist talks on our YouTube channel as soon as, as soon as we as soon as possible after the event. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Javier Cuadros is a senior researcher at the Natural History Museum in London, uh, with particular research interests in clay on Mars, clay life interaction, past environments as recorded by clays, mechanisms of clay processes, and the crystal chemistry of clays. He holds a PhD from the University of Granada, Spain, in, and is an associate editor of Clay Minerals Journal. And Javier's talk today is called What on Earth is Clay? So I'd like to warm welcome Javier. Over to you. Thank you very much for this warm introduction. And yes, I'm very pleased to be here. Always uh, very happy to talk about clay. In particular, I have done it very many times already to artists. Um, so I'm sure it will be enjoyable. <clears throat> uh, let me try and find my way <laughs> to sharing the screen. Here I go. Let me share a subhead. Okay, can you see the screen now? Perfect. Uh, and see the cursor moving around? Okay. So, yes, what on earth is clay? Of course, when we think of clay, we think of earth, but we'll say that we can find clay in many other places in the universe. Um, and this first picture illustrates that, you know, clay is everywhere. And this is a very kind of exotic type of place. It's a mangrove forest in the tropics, uh, particularly in Brazil. And well, if you look at it, you know, it's amazing to see the texture, the color of that clay, the richness. And having been there, uh, it's quite an experience. You know, every single step you sink up to your knee. So it's on the one side distressing until you get used to it. And on the other uh, hand, it's really uh, impressive and wonderful to be surrounded by this clay. Um, so just an example of where you can find it. And then of course, these are more familiar images of clay, the typical quarry and the uh, typical texture with the cracks that are produced by desiccation. As we know, clay can take a lot of water and that means that it uh, swells up and it fills a bigger space. And then when the water evaporates and the, and the clay dries, then of course, it shrinks back and then generates those very familiar cracks that we are used to see uh, in so many places. Now, if we want to uh, discuss uh, play from the point of view, perhaps, which is of greatest interest to artists, I think we have to go into the morphology of clay. This is a very unfamiliar image uh, of clay, I suppose, for most of you. Uh, there is a scale bar here that you can see at the very bottom. So this is 200 micrometers. And um, this in particular is talc. When talc is purified and ground, we call it commercially talcum powder. And this talc form in a hydrothermal sites in the ocean bottom, in the uh, ocean ridges. Um, so I think it illustrates very well, you know, the morphology, typical morphology of clay, typical to a certain extent. The main feature is that clay particles are very extended in length and width, but they're very thin. You can see here, for example, this is the width 
of these clay particles, which are like uh, developed like rosettes from in this uh, flowers. Um, so this is talc. This is also uh, very closely related to the uh, previous mineral that we saw. And again, you can see the same type of morphology. This is here. The scale bar is in the case of a lower resolution image. These are taken with uh, electron microscopes, scanning electron microscopes. But again, the same morphology. You see that these petals, very thin petals, are very, very wide and large uh, if you compare with the, uh, the very, the, how thin they are. I'll change in the uh, morphology of the particles. Here we have a mixture of two of them. One of them is called chloride, and there is the plates that you can see here. You see, they're uh, a very regular shape. Again, they're flat, they're relatively big, but very thin. And then you have this beautiful uh, lats here. There are different clay minerals called elite because they have different compositions. Uh, they will also have different morphologies, even if growing together in the same place. So again, they are very flat particles. Now this is amazing. This is again chloride. And these geometrical forms, they typically have either triangular or hexagonal forms, which are produced by the internal symmetry of the crystals. And you can see how the particles here are growing step by step. This is probably in a very hot medium in a very slow process of growth, which allows them to have to preserve the, uh, the symmetry of the internal symmetry. Um, so beautiful, but again, the basic morphology thing here, thicker, but still flakes, you know, very extended surface. Now, this is perhaps more a more frequent thing that we will see when looking at clay. Uh, this particularly is made in the lab. This is a kiln. And um, again, you have the uh, very thin flakes. And this is a very typical situation. They, they gather together, they coalesce, and they create other structures which are bigger. Like this, I don't know how to name it, some sort of cake that was generated here in this exact location. Again, we go back to chloride, um, same type of morphology here. We don't have those uh, so precise geometrical forms. These are more like uh, tubes, tubes with uh, flat sides, as you can see. So they are not exactly lats, totally flat, but as you can, if you, in some places, for example, here, you can see that it, is something which is rolling as, as it forms. So you have the original uh, flat particle, but it grows by rolling on itself. So it generates that sort of uh, prism. Strange shape, really. This is not very common. Now, this is uh, extremely beautiful. Uh, this is mectite. This is the, the type of clay that will absorb more most water. And this is typically the culprit in the, um, what we call the expanding clays that take a lot of water. They make the uh, uh, terrain swell, uh, um, sink as, as it dries. Uh, so it can cause a lot of damage to construction. Um, but look at them. This is really amazing. Again, this, the flakes forming rosettes here. This is very illustrative because what we have here is another mineral underneath, right? And from this mineral, the clay is growing by action of water. Water is, is reacting with this mineral and is generating the clay flakes, which you can see here. So very, very beautiful. I think probably originally there was something on top, also another grain, and that's why these surfaces are so flat because they were growing compressed against two, uh, two surfaces of the, of the other mineral. 
again, synthetic clay. You can see the flakes here. And in this case, for some reason, they gather forming these spheres. And some of them were rough and some of them, you know, the plates are perfectly oriented and they form very smooth spheres. Very interesting. We we'll never know what it's gonna see. Um, again, this very geometrical particles. Uh, look at this is the thickness of the plates. Uh, and some of them, they coalesce. And this is a way in which those, those uh, plates can grow in thickness. Very impressive. And now we look more in detail. This, this is another electron microscope, but this is looking through the material rather than on the surface of the material. And you can go to lower resolution. This is uh, the scale bar here is indicating one micrometer. This is a, a grain of glass, volcanic glass, that has been transformed into clay that you can see here, right? Uh, probably this clay has been displaced from the grain and that's why you can see it more or less that it preserves the shape of the grain, um, but it is out, outside it. And you can say it's very, very thin and very, and very large. And this one, this is also synthetic. Um, this is the typical veil morphology, um, like wrinkled uh, veil. But if you look in detail, there are lats that you can distinguish inside. So in actual fact, the veil is formed by the accumulation of many of these lats of ribbons. You, you can see one here very well. Okay. So, <clears throat> and again here, you know, we're now below one micrometer in the scale. So that is indicating us that uh, clays are particles extended and very thin. And this is very important for the properties. If we keep looking with uh, greater resolution, we get to the atomic structure of the clays. And these are layer silicates. So the, the uh, structure is in layers. And those layers are generated by this sort of thing. We have tetrahedra. You can see the tetrahedrons here, where we have mainly silicon in the middle and oxygen atoms. And the tetrahedra then form uh, rings. The tetrahedra are united to link to octahedra, where you usually have aluminum, magnesium, iron. And then another sheet of this tetrahedra, which I can see are inverted. So this, the layer is completely symmetrical. And then we will have another layer. Uh, so, and this is what we call the interlayer space, which is very important because it can take uh, all sorts of uh, substances in there in some of the clays. This is a different view of it. Uh, so you can see the, um, the tetrahedra and the octahedra uh, perhaps better um, and how they are distributed. Again, we have the composition of the different elements that you can find in the different points of the, of the structure. And then you have to imagine that these things are very, very large. They extend in the, let's say, X and Y direction tremendously, where the Z direction here is, is, is very small. And this is scale bar for you to <laughs> have an idea of the size, nanometers, or if you're more familiar with it, centimeters. And um, so what we have is something like, like this. We have individual layers and these layers, in some occasions they can take water, they can take salts, they can take organic matter, which is represented by those uh, uh, gray things here, right? Um, and in other cases, in, in, instead of the individual layers, this would be groups of layers, particles like the one that you have seen before. And then in between those particles, you still will have all sorts of things going in. Now, a little play here with size, the size of things. Um, this is represented in some sort of logarithmic scale the size of different things, some of which you are familiar with, like for example, yourself. Um, so we humans are of the scale of about one meter represented here. 
And then you have the scale going towards smaller things like the typical cell clay particle will sit here at this size, uh, 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus six, the atom, the atomic nucleus, and the smallest thing that we know, of, which is the quark, 10 to the minus 16 meters, right? And then on the other side, you have everything going up to the universe itself, which is bigger than 10 to the 24 meters. Um, so I think it's an interesting thing to see. Obviously, the scale is not very helpful because uh, there is a difference uh, of 10 times, 10,000 times, you know, between the ticks, uh, between each tick. But still, it can give you an idea of where clay particles are sitting in the scale of things uh, in terms of size in the universe. Now, going back to the clay morphology, and now referring to why clays have the properties that we we know very well that it can be used for, for the use in, uh, in art. So, because we have these particles, uh, these particles are individual and they can take in water and things that in some way will lubricate um, the space between the particles, then they can, they are mobile. You know, they can rotate, they can move, they can be displaced um, with very simple uh, forces. And that's what makes them plastic. That's what makes them um, malleable. And this is the experiences we have uh, of clays. This is uh, an example of clay again from, uh, from an ocean rich, beautiful green. When you fire it, it will become an intense red. So we have our dry clay, you add water, and then what is taking place is exactly this, taking all this water will generate will make the thing swell and become a lot more plastic than when it is dry. And then of course you can start modeling it and make things which are obviously very beautiful. Now, how, how is clay formed? Well, clay is formed typically in the, on the surface of the earth or uh, near the surface of the earth. A unit is rock, silicate rock, you need water. Without water, there's no reaction, nothing occurs, and you need time. Typically, clays will take from tens of thousands of years to millions of years to, to form. It's a very slow reaction. But it is accelerated by heat. In some places in the Earth, the water is very hot because of volcanic processes, and that accelerates the formation of clay. Acid, this is a bottle of acid, but there is natural acid, many places on earth, and they will make the water more aggressive and accelerate formation of clay. Believe it or not, salt. Salt also make uh, water very aggressive and microbial life. Microbial life can also accelerate the formation of clay and even transform it, uh, modify the composition of the clay, which is going to be formed. So here you have a an important type of relation now between the uh, geolog geological earth and the biological earth. Now this is uh, four pictures showing how clay develops. Uh, and this is a very real process, starting with uh, granite. And you have the slow dissolution of part, some of the uh, minerals that form the granite. It's a differential dissolution, and that's why they, you get this granulation, it starts crumbling. The crumbling becomes uh, worse, and then there's now transformation of the minerals that remain there. And then finally, you end up with something like this powder, which is particularly kaolin. And this has, for example, this is how the kaolin that we find in uh, Cornwall is formed. I was talking before about the uh, microbial action. Um, and these are two pictures of experiments that we uh, carried out at the Natural History Museum. The material here is volcanic glass, which has been ground. And volcanic glass is very good because it can dissolve easily and it's got a lot of mineral nutrients. 
Um, so microorganisms like it very much. And this is, these are experiments that were conducted with different types of natural water, uh, sea water, uh, um, fresh water. Um, um, and then you can see how the biofilms develop tremendously. In some places like this, this, this case, at the end of the experiment, the biofilm had completely embedded the whole mass of the, um, of the uh, grains. And they were attacking them, extracting the nutrients, and of course, in that processing, generating clay. Here we have another picture in which you can see these bubbles, which are generated by the respiration of the microorganisms. So these bubbles will grow and grow and grow, and then at some stage, it detach from the uh, biofilms and go up to the surface and, and disappear. And here, this is the biofilm that well, you can see here. This is seeing it from inside, as it were, showing the structure of it. So it's like a 3D foam structure. The microorganisms will be sitting there uh, within this structure. They, this structure allows water to go through so they can get fresh water, they can get uh, nutrients going through it. And as you can see, the biofilm embeds completely the mineral grains. And then there would be reaction taking place. So this, this thing that you see here is the, is the mineral grain. And here is an example of clay having formed by action of the microorganisms. Um, so th this is a diatom. It's a, the skeleton of an algae is made of or was made of calcium carbonate. So this algae grew there in this in the, one of these experiments and then died there also. And then within <coughs> the skeleton, clay formed. So this thing that you see here is newly formed clay. And so the seeth of calcium carbonate is partially dissolved. And so that's why we could we could spot this clay. You have here, you can see other skeletons of, uh, of algae or uh, diatoms of the, of the different type. So clay forms everywhere on earth. It forms in mountains, tropical areas, you know, the typical red soils of the tropics. Here you can see a picture, you can, see how the rock there is becoming soil, becoming clay, rivers, um, hydrothermal sites under the sea, the, the famous black smokers. So these fluids which come up at tremendous temperatures, when they are inside the rock, then it, they interact with the rock and they generate clay, like the talc I showed before. Um, Hydrothermal sites, this is Yellowstone. The different colors here are given by different microorganisms, which live in different conditions of temperature and acidity. So beautiful colors. And of course, mangrove forests. Uh, I showed the, 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 the um, picture before. And in many other places, we don't have enough space in the screen to show. Everywhere, in your garden, clay is forming right now. I hope you can have a garden. Right, so that's, that's the earth. But of course, as I said, we can find clay everywhere, really. And um, in the mid 1990s, a French probe discovered clay on the surface of Mars, a, a probe that was uh, orbiting, still is orbiting Mars, called Omega. And it was a big discovery because, as I said before, in order to have clay, you need to have water. So if there was that much clay on Mars, that meant that there was sufficient water, you know, to um, perhaps to have had life at some stage. Now the, the um, conditions on the surface of Mars, of Mars, Mars sorry, are, are very uh, bad. They, they cannot support clay, but they could have done in the, um, in the past. So yes, water on Mars is clay. For example, here we have the planet. 
there is a feature on the surface of the planet that you can see better here. It's called Morth Valleys. Um, so Morth is the Welsh for uh, uh, Mars, and Valleys is Latin for Valley. Um, and then if we get closer and closer to this point, this is a tremendous pay, place for clay because we have this big uh, valley, which forms gullies. And if we look at it more and more in detail, we end up seeing this type of thing. So the scale bar is indicated here uh, for this picture and this picture. But these are pictures taken from space. Uh, and you can see what resolution they can obtain. It's really amazing. You can see anything on the surface of Mars, uh, unless it is covered by something else, obviously. Um, but this is the typical structure that you, you can find in, in clay soils and you know, clay terrains, uh, like the picture I showed at the very beginning of the talk. And yes, when you, we look at it with uh, different instruments, this is clay. This is another picture again, Morse Valleys. And um, look at the resemblance to this other picture taken on Earth, right? Some sort of canyon here or a crater. There are layers of clay of different colors, as you can see in this other picture. There's water here in the picture from Earth, but there's no water here. There's not that much clay, sorry, let's just be a water left on the surface of Mars. Of Mars. But th this thing that you see here, that looks a bit, looks a bit like uh, water, is not water really, is olivine sand. Now, how was that clay full? Well, there are different origins. Uh, and uh, depending on the origin, we have different compositions. One of them, which seems to be the type of origin that created most of it is hydrothermal. So that's reaction of very hot water with the, uh, the crust of Mars. How do you generate hot water? With volcanoes, plenty of that on Mars. There's no, no lack of them. They are not alive anymore. The planet is dead, but they were active, uh, many of them. Impacts. Impacts are... Uh, when the, uh, if the impactor is sufficiently big, when it hits the ground, all the kinetic energy of, of the uh, impactor is transformed into thermal energy. So the tremendous, tremendous amount of heat which is generated and that can feed hydrothermal systems for tens of thousands of years. Lacustrine uh, environments, something like this one depicted here. Uh, not huge amounts of water, but yeah, standing standing bodies of water that will last for quite a long time. For example, we have an example here of typically they are craters generated by impacts, and then you have water. You can see here the channel that fed the crater. So there was a lake in this crater. And this is a picture from Curiosity in Gale Crater, uh, where again, it, it, there was, a, there was a lake in some stage, and these rocks here uh, were formed at the bottom of the lake, and they contain clay. Jezero Crater, which is the landing site of the, uh, of the new probe that arrived there in February, I think, uh, Perseverance. This is the exact ex spot where it landed. And again, this is a crater, you can see, the rim here, and here is the channel that fed it, and here is a delta that formed with all the material that the water was bringing into uh, into the um, the crater. So there are also clays in this in this crater, which they are, will be investigated by the uh, by perseverance. Now I look at the timing. Mm -hmm. Here we have the geological scale of Earth, and here the geological scale of Mars. Of course, we know a lot less of Mars, so it's much simpler than the scale that we have of, of the Earth. So the period when there was liquid water active on Mars is here, very, very early on in the planet. We're talking that these are billions 
uh, sorry, these are millions of years, millions of years, right? So all the clays that I showed before, they form here. And they have been preserved in the planet all this long period because uh, there's no water, so there's nothing to react with. Now, we are obviously are sitting here, time zero. This is the time when the dinosaurs disappear from Earth, you know, which is now called the, uh, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Mm -hmm. Right here. Um, and this is the period where dinosaurs lived. Now, if this looks ancient to us. See, when clay was formed on Mars, it's a lot more ancient. And very interestingly, we have a preservation of not only clay, but rocks of Mars uh, for a period which is so distant in time, for which we don't have it on Earth, because Earth being a bigger planet, um, the heat was kept much longer, so there is no no rocks are left of any of this uh, period. And very few of this period that we call Archean. Oh, this is a very famous picture of selfie of uh, curiosity. This is Gale Crater, and this is Mount Sharp, which is now uh, is going up to Mount Sharp, and the, the end of the mission will be at the very top. This is five kilometers high. It's not a small hill. Now, Curiosity uh, and also uh, Perseverance now, they have uh, scoops with which they can take samples from the soil, introduce them into the rubber and analyze them in different ways. That's why we know the, the different composition of the minerals and um, that they find. Uh, this is one of the rocks found at the bottom of a uh, crater. Um, you can see the red color. The red color is produced by the dust. Uh, it's not part of the rock. It's part of the dust, which has been deposited for all these eons on the surface of everything. And you can see here the contrast. Uh, curiosity can also drill. Uh, and this is after drilling. So it's investigating the rock underneath. And you can see the different color. There is about 30% clay in this dust that you see here. This is the moon. <laughs> and the big difference is that there is no water in the moon and that um, never there was any uh, that could be uh, really reactive and thus there's no clay. So the, the moon is basically the original basaltic rock and the dust of that rock generated by the impact of meteorites. Right, we're familiar with the type of things that we do with clay. Uh, we make ceramics, some of them very beautiful. And we tend to think of that as something which is everlasting, right? Obviously for the life of a person, uh, buildings, are much have a much longer life typically <clears throat> but that is not really the case ceramics will turn back to clay because they are sitting on the surface of the earth and in that place the stable mineral is the clay not the ceramic what we do when we create ceramic with uh, with clay is to uh, eliminate the water from it and to give cohesion to those particles uh, of clay. With, in order to do that, you need the, uh, the greaser, which is all the types of minerals that will melt and give cohesion to the clay. Right? So the clay itself will not be able to produce the ceramic. You can model it, but when you fire it, it will, be, it will crumble. So, but as you, we have it in contact with water, in water in contact with the atmosphere, with the rain and so on. You can see that what you see here is pretty much, you would say this is clay, but that's, that's what it is. Or ceramic very much in its way to become clay. 
So what we have on Earth is cycles because the Earth is still a living planet. There's plate tectonics. The plates are moving, um, they collide, some of them subside below other plates and so on. So we have new crust coming up, uh, old crust being destroyed and being uh, um, recycled. Then there is a constant generation, destruction of clay and formation of clay. So here you have some of the processes like uh, obviously volcanism, magma coming out, forming new rocks or uplift of the crust because of collisions of plates and then erosion, alteration of water, transport of the eroded rocks, sedimented in basins, transported by rivers and so on. And then of course, this is constantly being buried. When I said it's buried, you know, it's cemented and it's being transformed into different type of rock. And we have clay being formed, and then transported, deposited, being changed into different type of clay, depending on the temperature and the chemical compositions, the pressure and so on. And then finally destroyed because at some stage, uh, some temperature and pressure, clay stops being uh, stable and then it's transformed into something else, into metamorphic rocks. So I will leave you with this, uh, picture of the uh, cycles of rocks, uh, including clay. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Javier, uh, for a fantastic, incredibly interesting talk with some excellent um, slides, which make um, quite complex information and research very clear and easy to understand so thank you so much um i've got a couple of questions that are coming in if uh, if you're ready i can feel yes. those to you um uh, a, a good question a quick question from malcolm dixon he says do we know if the red dust on mars has iron content is that what gives it its red color yes this is iron not all of it is iron um there is um, the original rock, olivian, and pyroxene, and so on, but there is uh, some 30% or so of iron oxide, and that's what it gives the color. So the color of iron oxide is tremendously intense. You don't need much of it to uh, give color to the entire, the entire thing. So yeah, the red color of Mars is, is due to iron. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I've got a cool question. Well, there's a question from Agatha, um, who is a, a student studying here on the Art and Material Histories course. And she says, that was an unbelievably exciting presentation. Thank you um, very much. She's, she's <laughs> very excited. Uh, she says, I love the images, especially of, of uh, smekite and chlorine. Fantastic to hear about the microbiology of, of how clay was informed. Um, she says, I read about clay's ability to remove a range of contaminants, heavy mm -hmm. metals, and etc. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, could she ask you a little bit about that? And okay. also, the deposits of clay that we use for ceramic industries, um, are they still abundant? Um, okay. Um, on, on Earth, I'd imagine. So two questions yes. there. One about removing contaminants, and then the one yeah. about the abundance of... Okay. Can we go back to the uh, presentation? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right here. So if we go back, for example, here. Yeah, to this representation of the particles. You just need um, to share your screen again. Oh, okay. Just that green button. Where? At the bottom. Oh, okay, using, using this again. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. See it now? It's just coming into, there we go, yeah. Okay. So this, um, these particles, they, I said before, they can absorb all sorts of things, organic compounds, um, and this 
So you can also take um, organic contaminants or for example, uh, clear your skin, you know, uh, take all the uh, little organic, whatever it is, products that, that accumulate there. But they can also take uh, ions, metals, because they have, clays have an electric charge. They are typically negatively charged and metals have a positive charge when they are dissolved. So they can be absorbed on the, uh, on the surface of the clays. The um, clays, because they have such little particles, they have a tremendous specific surface. So one gram of clay can have the surface of, um, active surface of more or less a, a, a tennis court, one gram of clay. So that means that if you put water going through clay, you know, there's gonna be a tremendous interaction between the water, tremendous surface of interaction. So there are many places, uh, active places that can absorb those uh, contaminants. So yes, it is used. These are the general principles, how it operates. And then about the um, reserves of clay. Yeah, I think, I think they can be considered infinite. Um, um, clay forms slowly. So typically we don't have the, the uh, we cannot see clay, clay being regenerated while we are here, but still there's so much of it. Uh, that I don't think there is any um, need to think of uh, you know, it becoming extinct or anything like that. On the other hand, as you can see, clay recycles and we can, we can act in order to recycle clay. So that, that is not, it's not an issue. Thank you. Um, I've got a question about Mars, uh, the clay on Mars. <laughs> Yes. And um, it's the, the, the obvious question, I suppose, but it's a question about um, microbial life. So you spoke about, uh, you know, life being a kind of prerequisite almost for the, for the composition of clay on Earth. No, Do we have no, evidence no, of that? I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> I misunderstood. No, no. Uh, microbial life can help the creation of clay. That's oh. the creation of clay, but it's not a prerequisite though. Do we, do we see evidence of clays on Earth that don't have microbial life? Or is that an impossibility, actually? Uh, uh, well, yeah, it's very difficult because uh, life is so much widespread on Earth. Mm. It's very difficult to find any, any clay anywhere that where there's, there's no life of some type, even if very in low concentration. Mm. You know, even in, in those places that I showed before, where was it? Early here, yeah, there. Yeah, so yeah. Hydrothermal side. So even here, deep under the uh, the bottom of the ocean, you still find microbial life. Low concentration, as I said, but you still find it there. So on Earth, it's almost impossible not to find places which are completely sterile. Um, so you don't need to have microbial life in order to form clay, but. If you have clay, in particular clay that we can see on Mars, we know that that clay forms in waters of a chemistry that will support life on Earth, mm. where the pH is pretty much neutral, circle neutral, um, where the chemistry is going to be such that there are plenty of uh, mineral nutrients. So. Yes, it is possible in many, many areas where clay form on Mars are considered to be investigated as a possible places where life um, existed. The big problem is that the surface of clay is uh, uh, now very aggressive because of uh, the radiation coming from the sun, the cosmic rays, the, the atmosphere that is very thin. There is no magnetic field, so that means that all the radiation particles coming from the galaxy, from the sun, they will penetrate and, and, and um, get to the surface and destroy anything which is, right. which is alive. You know? So this is, I think the, for anything alive, we left on the surface of Mars, the uh, average time um, left to it would be about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, 
Right. So, and in terms of like um, the capabilities of persever perseverance and the other mach robot machines, do they have kind of um, microscopes? Are they able to look at clay in, in detail? Yes, they uh, they don't have microscopes to see uh, light images. They look at infrared. Uh -huh. Um, so we can see um, the, somehow the crystal structure and they can identify minerals with that. Uh, X-ray diffraction also is used to identify minerals. And then they do chemical analysis mm. of the rock and they can do thermal analysis. So they can heat up the minerals and look at the gases that escape from that reaction. Mm. Then from there, they can infer um, the type of mineral and also very importantly they can infer the type of organic molecules which were present in the rock mm. because when, when they are burned they, they're going to be destroyed be transformed into gases and then analyzing those gases you can somehow um, infer what original molecules were there present mm. so that is the type of uh, investigation but not optic microscopes let's say or even electron microscopes, like the images that I showed at the beginning, they don't have yet the technology to uh, have those instruments on, mounted on these probes. Mm. And the information that Perseverance is, is um, retrieving, is that being kind of beamed back to us like instantaneously? Are we processing that, that information right now? Yeah. Yes, yes, we are. So how these missions work is you have a team of scientists and engineers all the time living uh, on, in Mars time oh. in a specific place in, the, I think it's uh, California. And so they are constantly, so they sleep during the night on Mars. They live during the day on Mars, you know, uh, <laughs> because they are working all the time with the, with the rover. The rover can only move during the day because uh, it's, it's when there is light, you can, you can see where it is going. Yeah. So these scientists and engineers, they are living with that rover, they're moving it around, they're looking at what it sees, they're deciding what to analyze, where to go exactly, mm -hmm. um, what to investigate. Then all those data, the data they are collected are sent during the night. Um, this is the, uh, the bottleneck really of the uh, uh, capability of, of receiving data from Mars is, is the resending. Mm. The amount of data that can be gathered is huge, mm. but the time necessary to, to uh, send that information back to Earth is not mm. that much. So they have to compress the data, select them very much, send them to Earth. And then the group of scientists are working on that there is a period of six months where this group of people will um, interpret, start writing papers, and after these six months, the information becomes public. Hmm. And any other science on Earth can go and to the web page and start retrieving data and, and also work on them as, as if they were their own data. Oh, and that's how that is how it operates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very exciting. Yeah. And um there's no, let me just check the questions. Um, does clay, a question from Diane Frost, does clay like carbon come originally from space or was it created within the earth? Can you repeat Does clay? Yeah. Does clay like carbon ah, originally like come from space? No, 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 no. Um, well, carbon, some of it has come from space, but a lot of it has been produced on Earth too. Um, and clay has been formed uh, on Earth mainly. You know, clay is a silicate rock. The crust and even the mantle of the, the Earth is, is made mainly, mainly of silicate rock. Mm. So it's, you know, we are something like 80%, the earth is 80% silicate rock, so it is coming mainly from, from earth. Obviously meteorites, which are, have followed in the past and keep following, keep, keep uh, sorry, falling, 
So they are also silicate rocks mm. uh, and they will form clay eventually, if not collected <laughs> and taken to museums. Um, but the majority of it is, it comes from the earth itself. Obviously the earth has the same origin as those objects that come from, from the sky now, from yeah. other parts of the solar system. Yeah. And um, the moon doesn't have clay, it's, as you said, it's dry, it's dusty, um, there's been no evidence of water there, but are there other planets or objects within our solar system or beyond that we can assume or infer have clay? Yeah. Yes, we know, for example, it, it, from meteorites, we can see clay in meteorites, mm. tiny amounts. So these were formed, these meteorites were forming in planetoids, small bodies, but big enough to contain water for some time. Probably they were very hot at, at the beginning when they formed, and that meant that the reaction of the water with the uh, rock forming those planetoids, then it, it generated the um, the clay. Then those those bodies have been broken up, perhaps by impacts, and then bits of them have sometimes fall on Earth. And then we, we look at it, and we can see those veins of clay within the within the rock. Amazing. So yes, mm. so and clay we, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Given a set of conditions, you know, yeah. which are rather easy to fulfill, yes, you will have clay. So we expect that in other, in other planets, at some stage also, we, we will be discovering clay. Mm -hmm. There's a final question from Laura Gibbs, um, which is a nice question. And it, I, I think it's about the synthetic clays or the clays that you've created in the lab. And she mm -hmm. says, have you made anything from them? <laughs> 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 no, that, that, was, <laughs> that wasn't part of my interest. Uh, but generally, in order to do these investigations, you generate from a few milligrams to perhaps one gram or something like that. So you are working with very tiny amounts. You need to, usually for these experiments, you, you have to work with a small amount of solid material, which is going to become the clay in a big amount of water. Mm -hmm. in order to accelerate the reaction. Otherwise, you would be sitting there for years and your grant would finish and you wouldn't have done anything. And then, of course, you don't get any more grants. <laughs> um, so, yes, you have to <laughs> work with tiny, tiny amounts and then you will be investigating using uh, very powerful techniques. Mm. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank for you very talk. much for very having me. Interesting yeah. questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>